want to focus attention. A lot of people think that, oh, in every morning you should take a handful of pills to enhance yourself in all directions. But that's a problem that usually we want to enhance ourselves in particular directions to solve particular problems. There are very few in the things that probably enhance us in all directions that are useful. Focused attention is great if you want to write a paper or study something, but it's probably pretty really bad when driving a car out in the traffic. Then you should actually notice that there's something coming out there from the corner of my eye. Similarly, there are limitations on how much you can get from these enhancements. As a rule of thumb, I usually hand wave and say you get about 10 to 20 percent improvement on the psychological tests uh, uh, that most research papers do. Uh, this varies, of course, a bit with the test and drug. And the real problem is these tests are very divorced from the everyday reality we got. We actually don't know whether taking that same Daphne would improve my ability uh, uh, at writing a scientific paper. And that is the problem. We really need ecological tests. We actually need people in real world situations, we need real world measures to see whether they actually help. It's a quite interesting problem actually, because right now there is not much impetus to research in this, but still people are starting to take them. There is a kind of ongoing debate whether students should be taking them, because obviously a lot of students are taking drugs for various reasons, and some of the people taking stimulants claim that it's not recreational, it's for enhancement. Some of them might even be telling the truth. And, uh, well, are we cheating? Well, that, I find that, that I'm going to get back to later. But in particular, are we getting the most out of it? And I think quite often it's very, uh, people are simply misusing them in a sense that we're not getting the benefits, but we're getting the health risks. But there are other interesting way uses. This uh, is from an article about classical music where people are using beta blockers. Beta blockers do not generally make you smarter, but they reduce the feelings of stress. And a lot of people got stage fright. So in classical music, apparently, it's pretty common that people take beta blockers before uh, getting into the orchestra. And there is some debate whether this improves or uh, it improves the music or makes it worse. And I even found some amazing papers where I tried to estimate that, uh, thinking about the technical performance of piano. Well, that went up, but the emotional depth was quite low and so on. I find it very weird reading because it's something very subjective. But it might be that for certain pieces, yes, emotional depth is much more important than technical performance, and in others it might be reverse. So you, if you want to take a drug, you better tune into the task at hand, and, don't, don't, and not just take it because, well, everybody else are taking it. Well, let's rush through a few other interesting things. Transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, makes use of a magnetic field to induce uh, currents into the brain. So that figure 8 coil is uh, oscillating a magnetic field and as the field wiggles it creates an electric field but also wiggles inside the cortex and if you do this at the right frequency you can both make a part of the brain more stimulated or less stimulated. So this has been used in various very fun papers where people kind of tune out parts of the cortex and turn out that if you reduce activity in part of the prefrontal cortex you become better at uh, uh, checking for grammar errors. You don't know the meaning of a text but you notice misspellings. On the other hand, uh, you can stimulate other parts of the body to increase the plasticity and maybe improve motor learning. The downside with this, although it seems to be able to enhance an awful lot of things, it also seems to have a very, very small effect size. And I wouldn't really want there to use it too much, because if you can stimulate the body too much, you can probably trigger ep epileptic seizures. But still, people are experimenting with this, and I think sooner or later somebody is going to build the Radio Shack version uh, uh, Try it in the home. It's not that complex equipment. And a lot of this equipment is simple, and that is going to uh, spread in the future. So, this is Duty, a uh, genetically modified mouse. We're not having that many gene hackers yet, but I met a few of them, and uh, I think over the next few years we're going to see people actually starting to do much more gen uh, hobby genetic engineering. So, this little mouse got an overexpression of one protein used in learning. Uh, the LMDR receptor, one of the subunits. So it's better at learning things. It also got a slightly level, a high level of inflammatory pain. It feels certain kinds of pain slightly more, which is a beautiful example from a philosophical standpoint. You can ask people, would you want to have better memory, at the, but also get a bit more ache, aches when you get flu? And some people would say yes, some people would say no. But we actually have quite a lot of different genetically modified mice by now. We know how we can improve memory in different ways. Also quite subtle differences, for example, in how they forget things. 
Do they forget it rapidly because they overwrite it with new information? Or do they have a hard time forgetting it? So there's a lot of choices. It, the problem is, of course, that genetically modifying humans is, first of all, rather dangerous because, well, in most of these experiments you can, and, well, you can't really determine where the genes end up. So that means that there are serious ethical problems about having kids growing up with it. And it's also going to take a very long time. So even if you found some parents who were really eager to modify their kid to give them a bit better in their memory, by the time that kid has grown up, it's very likely that the understanding we got from the mice is going to have given us a pill or something else that can give the same benefit without genetic engineering. So there might be the same problem as with the cell phones. We might be upgrading you much more rapidly in other ways. But still, this is an interesting area of research to figure out. And besides, we can at least create trans mice that are much better than wild mice. We can make fluorescent mice with better memory that can run longer and live longer, which I think is a good at least for mice kind. There are also various interesting possibilities, of course, brain computer I don't have the time to really get into that much. As well as stem cells. Uh, repairing the brain is going to be important, I think, if, if we extend our lives. Because we're going to have insults to our brain, both uh, being hit in the head or having a uh, too long evening at the pub, or just the uh, random decay of neurons. Yeah. And I think we're going to find a lot of other new things in the future. The nice thing about the, the, the drugs is that we have them right here and can do the ethics discussion about it. But it looks like as we learn more and more about the brain, we find better ways of enhancing it. But there are plenty of ways of going outside the neural network. We can actually use the collective network instead. I think people quite often underestimate the power of collective intelligence uh, enhancement. Mostly, perhaps, because we're in an individualistic culture, we're thinking most about how can my brain be enhanced. But I found that uh, I became much smarter by hanging around smart people in Oxford. So when I can't solve a problem, I just borrow theirs. It works really well. And what the internet is about is borrowing your brains on a gigantic scale, including borrowing them for purposes that nobody has ever in, uh, intended. I mean, borrowing brains in order to create cute kitten pictures? <laughs> mm, that's an amazing technology. And in a sense it is, because uh, cute kitten pictures and robot cats and whatever we're using the internet for is in many ways improving human welfare, not in a serious soul manner by the way. It's not anything a philosopher would be defending very staunchly. But a lot of people get happy about it. We're finding new uses individually and collectively of the internet that actually improves our well-being. And similar, of course, we have other networks that do this. Science, for example, is very much a collective thing. Although I'm a loony libertarian, uh, politically speaking, you know, on average, I, I started to realize I'm a staunch collectivist when it comes to science. Mainly because we scientists are so hopeless at thinking and making correct experiments. We mess things up all the time. And the solution is, of course, to have somebody else point out, that's wrong, Anders. And then I hopefully fix it. Or I disprove that he's wrong or 10 other people to prove that we're actually working the wrong problem. The collective uh, truth-seeking of science is much, much more powerful than the individual one, and you can't really make use very much of individual geniuses. You need a whole crowd of them. And actually the geniuses, they need the glue that binds them together too, that actually checks that the result work. Similarly, we have the information markets, and also, of course, the market, the normal economic market, that also a way of doing collective intelligence. So if we can find ways of improving communication, we get enormous uh, effects. Of course, we can do this in different ways. This was me back in the 90s where I did my first web of computer. So, and uh, this days it's completely obsolete, of course, because everything I could do with that, I do now with my smartphone. And actually much more. That one never really worked and looked pretty hopeless and nerdy, which was kind of the point, of course. <laughs> But uh, at the point when it's in everybody's pocket, it becomes so much more powerful. Yesterday I attended a lecture about using cell phone networks for uh, healthcare informatics, uh, both in developed and developing countries. Um, the sensors inside this one are doing amazing things. You can extract so much information, which raises some privacy concerns, but also they improve uh, collective intelligence quite a lot. That way. And then of course, we can, once we're a constant network, we can pull this together. And I don't have the time to get into exactly how collective intelligence works, but I think there is a lot of things we haven't figured out yet. Wikipedia is not old. 
And we haven't figured out how to uh, make this success work in other domains, but I think we can get collective intelligence to produce an enormous amount of uh, the, the results. And then, of course, it's very interesting thing. Well, 